Eric Hobsbawm spent his early years in Vienna and then Berlin. Born in 1917 to an English father and an Austrian mother, it was in this crucible of pre-war Middle Europe that his lifelong communist views were formed. He moved to England in the 1930s and in time became one of the country's most eminent historians, writing such seminal works as his account of the 20th century, The Age of Extremes. There are few enough people left with his breadth of experience of the 20th century. So when we met at the British Academy in London, I asked him, as a historian of imperialism, what he thought of a world in which there was now only one real empire. I've seen them come and I've seen them go. Uh, in the course of my lifetime, all the old colonial empires went. Uh, the one empire which offered to last a thousand years lasted a good deal shorter. Another great project, my own, which hoped to last forever, didn't last forever. You're talking about the Soviet Union? I'm sort of talking of the Soviet Union or world communism. So uh, I don't give too much for the long life of anybody declaring themselves a world empire. Um, it'll last my time, but uh, probably uh, it won't last as long as some of the people that are going to read my books. You talk about your own particular project. I, I bet you're fed up with talking about this, but it is, I think, a legitimate area of questioning. You are famously a very long-standing member of WERF, a very long-standing member of the Communist Party, and yet everywhere one looks during the course of the 20th century where communism was applied, it failed. Do you think your commitment was a mistake then? My commitment to the cause of uh, the poor, the oppressed, wasn't. I think the solution that we thought uh, we had was a much more dodgy business. I thought at one time it was simply the historic fact that it won first in some rather marginal and barbarous countries. There's no question that made it much, much worse. Uh, if it hadn't been Russia, it would certainly not have been anything near as barbarous as it was. On the other hand, looking back, I must now say, uh, I can't call myself a communist anymore because the kind of party which I believed uh, was necessary, which Lenin pioneered, and which was, for a period in the 20th century, an incredibly formidable device for changing states and societies, has run out. This is, the, the historic period for that is gone. Nevertheless, the belief that this is not basically a just society, it may be a tolerable society, and it may be a rich society, and we live in the lucky, lucky times, and in the lucky part of the world, I think one shouldn't forget the others. The problem is the, the methodology, isn't it? I mean, the, no one disputes the ideals. Of course we would all seek a fairer world. But can you think of anywhere where those principles were applied in practice which created a society you admired? In some instances it created better societies. Where? I remember my friends from um, India going to Soviet Central Asia and saying, at least they've taught them all to read and write. It may not seem much for us, particularly now as we can see that there was a hell of a lot wrong and they were poor and all the rest of it. They taught them all to read and write, but they didn't let them vote. They didn't let them vote, um, but then neither did, well, the Americans didn't like to let the other people vote the wrong way. It's a pity, actually. I think the voting is, worried me less, worries me less, than the absence of freedom of opinion, particularly free press. 
What was it that made you decide to become a communist? Being in Germany between 1931 and 1933, living at a time when it was clear that there was no solution, or it seemed clear that there was no solution for the problems of the world, at least as I could see it as a teenager, which was not revolutionary. Um, living at a time when not only did you know you were on the Titanic, but you know it was going to hit the iceberg. The only question is what was going to happen when it hit the iceberg. And it was almost impossible. Obviously, if you had been, if I had been a German, I might have decided to say, oh, well, I'm only interested in the Germans, a solution only for the Germans. Uh, and I might have become a Nazi. I could understand why people in my school and so on sympathized with this. It didn't apply to me. I was English, treated as English. I was Jewish on top of it, so it didn't apply. Liberals, social democrats were not on. Liberals was exactly what was failing. I can understand that in the context of Germany with Nazism uh, emerging, those, that bipolar intellectual or political world, but that wasn't the world in which you found yourself in this country. And while membership of the party was a, must have been a warm embrace, by God, it demanded a degree of fealty from you, didn't it? You wanted to change the world. You thought, you see, we were the first globalizers. We believed, as indeed Marx believed from the word going, that this is the way history was going, therefore there must be global solutions. Uh, even though, of course, we were concerned about our own place, our own countries, and so on. And nobody else produced global solutions. And above all, when I came to England, there was the crucial question, the absolutely fundamental question, of the fight against fascism. That's to say, the fight against the Nazis. Do you think it was a mistake to adhere to those beliefs for as long as you did? It didn't make much difference, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, whether I kept a, a party card, if you like, you know, uh, I'm not a quitter by nature. Uh, that's one thing if you want an answer. I wanted to stay, if you like, to pay tribute to a cause which was a good cause, a great cause, a global cause, never mind Stalin, never mind the Soviet Union, never mind anything. But it didn't really make any difference to what I did uh, afterwards, I, I, I went on doing what I'd done before, namely teaching people, writing books, and uh, actually I took very little part in politics. I'm not, I'm not a, political, a political figure, I don't have the talent. To the extent that you did though, um, through your work, proselytise for that cause, do you now regret it given that everywhere we've seen it attempted, it's failed? I've not proselytized for the Communist Party. I proselytized against capitalism and for the liberation of colonial peoples, for the poor, against the rich. And I don't regret that. Why should I? When you look at the world as we find it now, with all of the edifices that owed some sort of political uh, antecedents to that, to that belief, um, and you see this single great capitalist power, what do you feel? I like America. I've worked in America, so in a sense, uh, it's a nice country, it has drawbacks. I'm sufficient of an old anti-imperialist to be suspicious of any world empires. Uh, particularly world empires that don't have anybody to keep them in check. For the last 50 years, and it's lucky for you and for me and for all of us that this was so, there were two world empires that kept themselves in check. 
One of them was a more agreeable one that one would prefer to live under. The other was less agreeable. But nevertheless, both had the function of keeping each other in check. One of them disappeared, and the net effect of this is, I think, uh, a certain degree the occupational disease of, you might say, world conquerors, particularly people that feel that their military power is unlimited, namely megalomania. I think there needs to be a learning curve because there are, even in the United States, a lot of people, even among the officials in the United States, who believe that world empires live in the real world and the real world is a bit too big and a bit too complicated to be run single-handed uh, from Washington. Uh, I hope that that learning curve can start or at least progress rapidly. All right, Cobbs, well, thank you. <laughs>